You know, I left over the announcements and I ran into a horde of crazy coffee drinkers back here and they dumped their coffee all over me. It was out of control. And now I've been trying to get these stains out with a cloth here. Somebody gave me a tip in the coffee group and they said, if you just rub it with this, but the more I rub it, the worse it gets. I tried some ketchup. Somebody told me ketchup might do it, but it just made it worse. Do you ever hate this? You get stains on your clothes and you can't get them out? I can't stand this. It happens all the time, right? You spill something on your clothes, next thing you know, you're a mess, and you work and work and work, and you try to get it out, but you can't get it out. It's, it's you, you know, it used to be white and new and shiny, and now it's just a mess. And you work and scrub, and you try all the magic-like stuff they sell in the supermarket to get this stuff out, but it just won't come out. Now, I tell you, my mother-in-law has special skills in this area, seriously. If I give her shirts with a stain that I can't get out, she can usually get it out. She uses old-fashioned elbow grease and some bleach, and it's amazing what she can do. But, you know, there's even some stains my mother-in-law can't get out. Seriously. I give her these clothes, and she works on it, works on it, she hands it back to me. It's still the same. It's totally stained. It just doesn't come out. Now, I hate to tell you, this is not just true of clothes. This is also true of life. When we're first born, we seem innocent enough, don't we? We come out looking innocent and clean and new and shiny, as if everything's just wonderful, hunky-dory, but we're not really aware that deep inside of us, there's already a cancer at work that's going to stain our lives for the whole scope of our lives. Stained. Our true identity begins to be assaulted from the very beginning. The identity that we remain the image of God to reflect the glory of God. But instead, we start to become people that instead look more like this shirt. Tarnished. The image of God tarnished in us. There's stains that get stuck to us that we just can't get out. No matter how hard we work at it, no matter how hard we try, we can't get the stains out. We can't get the stains off. They're just stuck on there. The Bible uses this clothes illustration over and over again. In Isaiah, we find out that even our best acts are like filthy rags before the Lord. Even our most righteous attempts at living are just like filthy, stained rags. Isaiah goes on to describe that people in the ancient world were dressed in garments of despair and depression instead of Garments of praise and happiness. And Zechariah, the high priest at the time, he's dressed in this ill-fitting, dark, dirty clothes. Standing there with Satan next to him, ready to accuse him, to point out all the stains. That's what Satan does, you know. He points at all the stains and reminds you of where they came from and how it's your fault that they're there. That's the voice of the accuser. I was thinking this week about my own life when I first became aware of my stains. I was probably like, I don't know, nine or ten years old when I took my brother who was four and a half years younger than me. I was so mad at him one day. I remember grabbing him by the arm, spinning in a circle, and slamming his head into a wall. I think I gave him a concussion. I could have probably killed him. But I remember afterwards thinking, what happened to me just now? I lost my mind. What's going on? And then a few years later when I got to be a middle school kid, me and my friends discovered that the garbage men, my friend's dad owned a garbage company, they, they kept Playboy magazines in their trucks. So we went there and we started to collect those babies. Pretty soon we hit a whole stack. We'd go, we'd go read them. Yeah, and we hit them hidden in this place there in the garbage company and we had them all hidden out. And Then my friend's mom discovered the stack and discovered us. And suddenly... I was deeply aware that something was really wrong with me. You ever had this moment? When you're deeply aware that something's really wrong with you? That's called shame. It's something we all experience at some point. We kind of realize something is really wrong with us. I mean, how can we be doing this stuff? When's the first time you ever had that realization that something was really wrong with you. And if you think about it, some of the stains that are on our lives are self-inflicted stains. We put them there. We, we made them happen. Other stains were put there by other people whose, I don't know, mess splatters over onto our lives and now we are wearing their stains. And our lives are a mess because their lives are a mess. 
And we spend all kinds of time trying to get rid of these stains, trying to stop the destructive habits, the things we do to kind of, that cause these stains. We work hard, we, we take all the remedies we can, and we, we scrub and we rub and we scrub and we rub and nothing really works. We're just stuck with them. I mean, how many of us in this room have said, at some point in our life, we're going to change our eating habits. We're going to cut sugar out. We're going to lessen the amount of fat we're eating. We're going to cut the Diet Coke habit we have or the whatever it is, right? We, we go on Facebook. We get all the self-help things in the world that tell us on Facebook. they got all these programs. In fact, if you talk about them in your house, all of a sudden your Facebook feed starts feeding you. Do you notice this? They have Big Brothers listening, folks, right? And you start getting these feeds about what you, how you can overcome your addiction to Diet Coke, your addiction to sugar, whatever it is, a quick, hit, quick help thing. But the reality is, we go right back to it. We're so deeply connected to the destructive things in our lives, we can't even stop when we try. True? Yeah. Now here's the thing, we're all trying to get rid of our stains. We're all trying to keep them hidden. In fact, keeping our stains hidden is our best quality. We dress up in our church clothes, I think half the reason is because it keeps these shirts we're wearing elsewhere hidden. So we put our nice church clothes on, underneath there's this mess. But as long as we're in our church clothes and we're here for an hour, things are good. We can at least pretend for an hour that the stains aren't so bad, that they're okay. We can deal with them. We got under control. You know, I can tell you this is a universal human pursuit. When I was at camp, Years ago, I read the story of the blind man that Jesus rubbed mud in his eyes. I told the kids a story that the story, you know, he meets this blind man, he puts mud in his eyes, and he tells them to go to the pool of Siloam, which is a living water pool outside of Jerusalem, about a quarter mile from where Jesus was. So he tells this blind man to take a journey to the pool and wash himself there, and then he'll be able to see. This guy does it. So I told this group of kids. I said, you know, I think we have blindnesses, we have, we have struggles, we have disabilities, things that we can't get rid of. Jesus wants to heal you today. If you, want, if you think that you have some of these things you want to be healed, why don't you come down to the front and get some mud on your face. There's a lake a quarter mile down. Let's go to the lake and let's wash in the lake and Jesus will meet us there and heal us. So I didn't know if one kid would come or two, but pretty soon there were hundreds of students down in front getting mud. I followed them to the lake and sat on the beach and watched. Kid after kid entered the water. One girl went in and was in there for 30 minutes, splashing water over her head, over her face, weeping, carrying on. I finally went into the water and I got her and said, it's okay, Jesus has heard your cry. He has removed your stains. Now you might be thinking, what are we talking about this for, Klein? Well, look at Revelation 7. It opens talking about garments, talking about clothes. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. White robes. No stains, completely washed and clean, new. Not new because they're actually new, but new because they've been resurrected to new life from death. Dry and dead bones that have been raised from the dead. This is resurrection life. This is something only Jesus can do. He, he's the only one who can take our stains, the stuff intended for our destruction, intended to mar us and keep us from being all that God intended for us to be. Right, made in his image, giving off his glory to the world, and he can raise it from the dead. Those are the people in the white robes. Now to grasp the full meaning of this passage, you've got to grasp, grapple with, wrestle with your own stains. You've got to look at them honestly. You have to ask yourself, what stains are on my life in 2022 as I sit here this morning? You've got to name them. Some of them have been there for years. You've never dealt with them. Some of you started reading pornography at 12, and you're still reading it at 52. Some of our kids have phones now, 
They don't have to go hide in a, gar in a barn and collect magazines. They can just look on their phone and there's the pornography right in front of their face. Destroying their lives, destroying their view of sexuality and of the opposite sex in ways that only the enemy can, can weave into the world. So we're stained, we're broken, we're wounded. And because we don't deal with this stuff, these things become festering wounds that just spiral out of control. So who in the world gets to wear these white robes? Seriously, if this is what God's working with, who gets to wear them? Well, look at this. John kind of wonders this. Then one of the elders asked me, one of the angels, these in the white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? John says, sir, only you know. And he said, they are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, depending on your view of Revelation, you might think the great tribulation is a seven-year period where the people have been martyred and now have come to this place. Or you might believe that the great tribulation is this time we live in right now. In fact, the word tribulation is actually a word that refers to suffering, pressure. It's like being pressed like a grape. It's like you're in a grape uh, press and they're stepping on you. That's tribulation. You're being squeezed. You're being crushed. You're being pressed. You're being pounded so that you'll suffer, so you'll be stained. Jesus described it as a time when wickedness would grow exponentially and the love of most people would grow cold. These white robed people standing in the throne of Revelation 7, they were pressed and distressed. They were stained. They have suffered. They are wounded. And catch this line again. Let's put that verse back up there. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I mean, that's paradoxical. Think about it. Blood. Can you imagine saying, I'm going to take some blood and clean this shirt? How would that go for me? That would go terribly. I'd be red all over the place. But when Jesus' blood washes my stains, they're made white. This is turned into a white robe. It's unbelievable. This idea of being washed is all through the scripture. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 says this, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 1 Corinthians 6, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now it's interesting that it says they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That's not really accurate translation because we really can't wash our robes, right? I could work on this for hours. I could give it to my mother-in-law. She could work on it for hours. But this shirt is literally stained beyond hope. Most of our lives are stained beyond hope. So we can't wash them. So how do you get washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's, it's super simple. You stand before him like this, and you name the stains. Oh, that's the pornography magazines when I was 12 years old. Lord, can you clean that mess? Oh, that's the time I threw my brother into the wall. Oh, that's the, I mean, it goes on and on. I'm 62. You know how many stains I've got? I've got thousands of stains. They need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. But you can't get washed unless you stand like this before him and name them and ask him to wash them, to clean you, to cleanse you, to change you. And once you get washed, then your response is the same response the angels have when they stand in heaven, when they say this in Revelation 7, verse 12, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. When you grasp, when you grasp what the resurrection power of Jesus can do in your life, that leads to real worship. That's when you want to sing about the dry bones rattling. That's when you find yourself going, whoa, Lord, unbelievable. You have washed this mess and made it white in the blood of the Lamb. That's unbelievable. When you grasp that, you get it. And this is happening through Jesus Christ all over the world. So I'm going to show you a two-minute video. This is from the Alpha series. This is a guy in Calcutta, India. 
telling the story of how he was washed in the blood of the Lamb. I had lots of addiction in my life, many kinds of addiction, smoking, uh, drinking alcohol, taking so many store tobacco stops and other things, ganja. Although I was doing all those things, but I found there is something missing in my life. One day my uncle presented me a book because he knew that I love books. And it was pretty new books with a beautiful cover picture, uh, good looking to me. And I told my uncle, okay, I'll read this because this looks very beautiful for me. And I started reading and I found that this is uh, Bible. All the words is about Jesus Christ and his life and teaching and all. It was not for, not, not like other, other kind of books what I have read before. Some novels, some detective uh, books. It's completely different. Uh, I didn't understand many things out of those books, but I, I was enjoying it. And I asked my uncle that from where you got this book and he told me one couple, they presented him this book. One evening, one Sunday evening, I kneeled down for the first time uh, to Jesus Christ. Uh, I prayed, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Please, Lord, forgive me. And I was crying and crying. And God's Spirit uh, touched me so deeply that I was crying with joy. Uh, I never knew that people, can, people could cry in a joy. I don't know... Uh, uh, at what time I slept at that night, but the thing is, uh, the very next day morning, uh, I got up from my bed and it was completely new day for me. And my all habits left from me within a night. God can do this miracle because He did in my life. Within one night, all habits gone, a new person born. Now, I love that that story is from Calcutta, India. I love that. Because these people in the white robes, if you noticed, they come from every tribe, every nation, every language, every people on the face of the earth. These aren't Americans. These are the kingdom of Jesus, which is every color, every person, every language, every nation. This resurrection life is available to all people who identify their stains and stand before the Lord Jesus and say, Jesus, can you do something for me that I can't do for myself? And we could stop this whole lesson in Revelation, but we got to look at these last few verses. There's a little more magic here for us. Look at verse 15 with me. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in the temple. And he sits on the throne, and he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. So in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a dividing wall that divided the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Israelites. Women weren't even allowed in there at all. But most people, unless you were an Israelite man, could not even get close to God. In fact, the priests were the only ones who served God day and night in the temple, and they got the closest to God, but only the high priests could go through the curtain once a year to stand in the presence of God. There was all these dividing posts along the way. You couldn't get in. So your relationship with God was only through this building, through these priests, at a great distance, you couldn't really approach this God. There was even a sign posted they found, the archaeologists have found the sign that was on the wall. It was in red. Here's what it reads. No foreigners to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. If you were a foreigner, if you were a Dutchman, if you were a German, if you were an African, if you were a Gentile of any kind, you weren't welcome. You had no access to this God. Only through the Israelites. So God dwelt in this temple behind the curtain. And here's Revelation offering us a new picture. Now put that verse back up again, Karn. 
John's playing on words here. Not, not that verse. Oh, there we go. No, not that verse. There we go. Um, this is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. That's a plan of words. The only people that did that in the Israelite days were the priests. But now, the people in the white robes from every tribe, every nation, every language, they're serving God in his presence before the throne of God. I love that. So it's going to be a giant tribe represented by every neighborhood on planet Earth, all those people that have found Jesus and are dressed in the white robes. And how will this impact those people? Check these last verses in the passage. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So you don't have to stay. You don't have to stay in your stained clothes. You don't have to live broken and stained and ashamed of what's really wrong with you. You and I and the power of Jesus we are the ones in the white robes. When we surrender our lives to Jesus, he does something in us that is beyond our comprehension. Washes us clean in his blood. Gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Plants his spirit in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Planted inside of you. So welcome, white robe wearers. I can't see yours right now, but it's there somewhere. And here's the great news. Here on planet Earth, if I wore this white robe for a couple days, it would be a mess again, right? Yeah, you know me. It'd be a total mess. But the great thing about this passage, when you put this white robe on in heaven, it's the aorist tense in the Greek. It's going to be a once for all, one and done. When Jesus puts this white robe on you before the throne of God, it will never get stained again. It will never be messed up again. It will never be wounded again because he will shelter you, as this verse says, from any scorching heat. He'll be your shepherd. You will be living directly connected, looking into the face of the Lamb of God, the Lord of heaven and earth, the King. That's awesome. That's a reason to worship, don't you think? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these images in the book of Revelation that lift us, Lord, and help us to see resurrection life. Help us to reflect on it. Help us to see it. Help us to have access to it. Lord, this morning I pray that you would help each one of us to look deeply at our stains and offer them to you so that the power of your resurrection might wash over them and we can be dressed in white robes, like you promised. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.